service. We're glad that you're joining us this morning. We wish that we could be together uh, in person, but we are the next best thing, I guess. I want to read a couple of verses from Psalm 62 as we begin this morning. Psalm 62 verses 1 and 2 says, Truly my soul waiteth upon God. From him cometh my salvation. He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be greatly moved. And truly he is our rock and our defense. Uh, especially in the days in which we live as crazy as they are. Uh, let me make a couple of announcements before we get into uh, having a word of prayer and into the remainder of our service. We will be having, uh, Lord willing, our Circle of Ten, Tuesday at 10, 2, and 7 p.m. If you've not registered yet and you'd like to come, please call the church office or send us an email. Uh, and I understand that there are some that do not agree that we should be doing that at this particular moment in time. Uh, as a pastor, I have an obligation to try and minister to our entire congregation. We all have different points of view, and it is important for us to remember that fellowship and Bible study and prayer is essential portions of our life as a church. And so we will gather, uh, we will observe COVID protocols, in fact, we are under the limit that the, ch the government has established that churches can have 10. Uh, and at this moment in time, none of our sessions have more than eight. And so we would uh, encourage you to pray for us as we endeavor to encourage other people uh, to spend some time in the word together and to have prayer. If there's one thing that we need in these days, it is corporate prayer. And we need as a church to be lifting up uh, these circumstances before the only one that can do anything about them. And so we encourage you to pray for us uh, and just let's pray that this ends soon. Um, I think that's pretty much all of the announcements. We will be monitoring. Apparently, the government is supposed to be uh, introducing new restrictions, and uh, that may wipe out our circle of 10, so we will let you know as we receive more information. Uh, we're trying our best to be responsible, to ensure that our church people are safe, and uh, so just remember us in prayer if you would. I think that's all that I have to say as a precursor as we begin this morning, so let's have a word of prayer and we'll get right into the service. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you, God, that you are God, that you are on the throne, that, Father, none of this has surprised you, that you are in control of all things, that you are sovereign over the affairs of man. And, Father, I pray today that as we gather online, that you may encourage our hearts. Lord, we desperately need it in these days. We need a touch from heaven. We need the Spirit of God to do something in each of our hearts. And so I pray today that you may have your will and way in every soul that is watching this service. Father, may you reveal yourself. May you, through your Holy Spirit, work in each heart. Father, we pray that if there are any watching today that have never trusted Christ, that today would be the day that they come to know him who to know is life eternal. God, I pray today that you may be magnified and glorified, that you, Father, would be well pleased with all that takes place here in this place. We thank you for this opportunity, and we pray your blessing upon us now. In Christ's name, amen. This morning we're going to call upon our trio of ladies to come and uh, minister to us in song. That will be Rebecca, Kathleen, and Muriel.
and with the beast of the earth. And when he'd opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes were given unto every one of them. And it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun came, became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood, and the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. And the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman, and every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains, and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us, and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? And after these things I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth. And the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. And I heard the number of them which were sealed, and they were sealed in 144,000 of the tribes of the children of Israel. Of the tribe of Judah were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Reuben were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Gad were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Asher were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Naphtali were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Manassas were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Simeon were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Levi were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Issachar were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Zebulun were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Joseph were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Benjamin were sealed 12,000. After this I beheld and lo a great multitude which no man could number of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues stood before the throne and before the Lamb clothed with white robes and palms in their hands and cried with a loud voice saying salvation to our God which sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb and all the angels stood round about the throne, and about the elders and the four beasts, and fell before the throne on their faces and worshipped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto our God forever and ever. Amen. And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes, and whence came they? And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, These are they which came out of great tribulation, and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore are they before the throne of God, and serve him day and night in his temple. And he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them, and they shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more, neither shall the sun light on them, nor any heat. For the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them and shall lead them unto living fountains of water, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. Father, I pray in this morning's hour that you may indeed remove from our hearts and thoughts anything other than what you have for us. Father, I pray that you may help us to understand that there is a better day coming. 
that there is a day when the books will be balanced, when vengeance will be accomplished on those who have rebelled against God. There is coming a day when you will wipe all tears from our eyes. And Father, I pray that in these days, <clears throat> these days of uncertainty, these days of confusion, these days of chaos and argument and disagreement, that you may help us, Father, that our focus may not be on the things of this world. That our focus may not be on politics. It may not be on a virus. It may not be in differences of opinion. But that our focus will solely be on the truth of the word of God. That he that liveth, that ever was and will ever be, is still on the throne. And that one day, each of us will kneel before him. And every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Father, help us that we would not concentrate on those things that divide us. But that we would concentrate on those things that unite us. Our faith in Jesus Christ. And the ever living truth of the word of God. Father speak to us now we pray. In Jesus precious name. Amen. We now come to the major section of Revelation. That being the chapters on judgment. Beginning in Revelation chapter 6 and verse 1. And going through chapter 19 and verse 10. These chapters contain three series of judgments each. We have in chapter 1 or chapter 6 verse 1 through chapter 8 through verse 1, we have the seven seal judgments. In chapter 8 verse 2 through chapter 11 verse 19, we have the trumpet judgments. And then in chapter 15 through chapter 16 of verse 21, we have the vials or the bulls judgment. One pastor has written this that the judgments have been designated as follows. In the opening of the seals, judgment is decreed. In the opening of the trumpets, judge, judgment is announced. And in the opening of the vials, judgment is executed. However you look at the seven seals and the seven trumpets and the seven vials, and however you look at Revelation, the fact of the matter is this. Though, though we may disagree on some eschatological items, we all understand the truth of the fact that God's judgment is coming on this earth. We all agree with the fact that Jesus Christ is coming again. And that truth in itself ought to serve as a motivator for every child of God to live for him in these days. To be busy in telling others the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. As we have read through chapter 6 and chapter 7, you may have noticed that the seventh seal hasn't been dealt with yet. And that's because the seventh seal is dealt with in chapter 8 and verse 1. There is a bit of a parenthesis between the sixth seal and the seventh seal. In which the reader is given more information as to the events that will ultimately for us heighten the drama of the tribulation period. How do we view these three series of judgments and how do they relate to each other? Well, there are different views and we're just going to, to mention them to you this morning as we move through this. There are some who claim that they are parallel, that all three series of judgments are taking place at the same time. That uh, they are analyzed in three different manners in the book of Revelation. There are others that believe that they run consecutively rather than concurrently. That they are running one after the other. That in fact there are 21 different judgments. Each one beginning with the completion of the previous. Tim LaHaye rejects the idea that the... Uh, they run concurrently or that they run at the same time. And he writes this, 
The problem with that idea is that it completely overlooks the fact that the opening of the seventh seal introduces the trumpet judgments of chapter 8 and 9. And the blowing of the seventh trumpet introduces the seven bowls of chapter 16. Therefore, we may conclude that the three judgments run chronologically and represent three succeeding periods of the tribulation. The seal judgments cover the approximately the first quarter of the tribulation period or the first 21 months. The most accepted view amongst scholars and theologians is that the seal judgments bring on the trumpet judgments. And then in turn, the trumpet judgments bring on the bull judgments, which are the most ferocious of the judgments to come. The worship described in chapter 4 and 5 is preparation for the wrath that is about to come upon the earth in chapter 6 through 19. Warren Wiersbe wrote this. He said, it seems strange to us that worship and judgment should go together. But this is because we do not understand either the holiness of God or the sinfulness of man. Nor do we grasp the total picture of what God wants to accomplish and how the forces of evil have opposed him. God is long-suffering, but eventually he must judge sin and vindicate his servants. So as we begin to look at the seal judgments this morning, I think it's important to reiterate for each of you the fact that this church, in its doctrinal statement, and myself as a pastor, hold to the pre-tribulational rapture view of the church. That we believe before the tribulation begins that God's people will be taken out of this world. That we will be at home with our Lord. And that the wrath will then be free to be poured upon this world. So as we get to chapter 6 and verse 1 that we're beginning with this morning. We are already in heaven. We are already in the presence of our Lord. So in chapter 6, verses 1 through 17, we have the seal judgments given for us. The first six seals are discussed here in Revelation 6. But the seventh seal we do not see and mentioned until chapter 8 and verse 1. And in between, in chapter 7, we have a parenthesis of additional information that is given to each of us. The Lamb, Jesus Christ, opens the seals. We saw last week that the Lamb is the only one worthy to open the seals of the judgment to come. After each of the first four seals is opened, one of the living creatures issues a command, come and see. And we can assume that this is naturally directed to John because it is to John that all of this is being revealed. So verses 1 and 2 of chapter 6 give us the first seal. And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder. One of the four beasts saying, Come and see. And I saw, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow. And a crown was given unto him. And he went forth conquering, and to conquer. The voice of the first living creature sounded like thunder. The rumbling of thunder usually introduces a storm that is on its way. In scripture, the first reference to, the, to thunder was in connection with God's judgment upon Egypt in, in Exodus chapter 9 and verse 23. The white horse here, and I understand that there are a variety of opinions and, and uh, different views in relationship to all of this, but I don't have the time to give you all of the different views that are out there. So my job is to try my best to give you what I believe the Bible is teaching. So the first seal, the first rider, is on a white horse. The rider symbolizes the Antichrist. Technically, the tribulation period begins when the Antichrist makes a peace accord with the nation of Israel. He makes a seven-year covenant with them. Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 to 27, it says this. Seventy weeks have been determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city 
to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the Prince, shall be seven weeks, and threescore and two weeks, and the street shall be built again, and the wall even in troublous times. And after threescore and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself and the people of the Prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. And the end thereof shall be a flood. And unto the end of the war desolations are determined. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. And in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice, the oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of abominations he shall make it desolate. Even until the consummation and that determined shall be poured out upon the desolate. You understand Bible prophecy and Daniel's 70 weeks vision. You understand that the Antichrist will make a peace accord with the nation of Israel. He will give them a sense of security. But we also understand that the Bible teaches that halfway through that period of seven years, the Antichrist will break his covenant with the nation of Israel. And that he will desecrate the temple. And that he will turn his back on what he has said that he would do for the nation of Israel. At the beginning, he pledges to protect them from outside attack. If Israel simply agrees to surrender territory and begin disarmament, Israel, it is believed, looks upon this individual as being a political savior. As being the one that will give them the security that they have longed for so, for so long. The white horse symbolizes for us that he is a counterfeit Messiah. We understand that Satan is the great counterfeiter. That everything he does, he tries to wrap within the appearance of righteousness. That he is an angel of light. We know that he tried to perform miracles over and over again. That he has tried to deceive and he does deceive. And in fact, in these last days, he will deceive, as it were, even the very elect. He is the counterfeit Messiah. He is given a crown. He has a bow, but no arrows. And Daniel predicted for us that the false Messiah would destroy many in, by peaceful negotiations. In Daniel chapter 8 and verse 25 it says, And through his policy also he shall cause craft to prosper in his hand, and he shall magnify himself in his heart, and by peace shall destroy many. He shall also stand up against the prince of, the prince of princes, but he shall be broken without hand. Paul declared that destruction would swiftly follow the cries of peace in the day of the Lord in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Satan gave the rider, the Antichrist, a crown in Revelation chapter 6 and verse 2. And the rider accepts it. The Antichrist accepts it. When Satan tempted Christ, he offered him the nations of the world if he would only bow down and worship him in Luke chapter 4. The false Messiah here gladly accepts this satanic gift. And his ultimate goal, the Antichrist, the rider on the white horse, is to conquer the world. And that brings us to verses 3 and 4 of chapter 6, which is the second seal. Verse 3 says, And when he had opened the second seal, I heard the second beast say, Come and see. And there went out another horse that was red, and power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth, and that they should kill one another. And there was given unto him a great sword. And when he had opened the third seal, I heard the third beast say, Come and see, and I beheld, and lo, a black horse. Well, let's, before we get to the third seal, let's deal with the second seal. Uh, the second horse is red. The color of blood. And it is an indelible mark of warfare. John saw that this rider had the power to take peace from the earth. 
For peace to be taken away, it must first exist. So that means that with the Antichrist making the peace accord with Israel, that peace that has been so elusive in all of our lifetimes is finally established. But now, with the second seal, that peace is taken away. Ezekiel predicted that in the last days there would be an invasion from a land to the north. In Ezekiel chapter 38, verses 8, 11, 15, and 16, it says this, And after many days thou shalt be visited, in the latter years thou shalt come into the land that is brought back from the sword, and is gathered out of many people against the mountains of Israel, which have been always waste. But it is brought forth out of the nations, and they shall dwell safely, all of them. And thou shalt say, I will go up to the land of unwalled villages. I will go to them that are at rest, that dwell safely. All of them dwell without walls and having neither bars nor gates. And thou shalt come from thy place out of the north parts, thou and many people with thee, all of them riding upon horses, a great company and a mighty army. And thou shalt come up against my people of Israel. As a cloud to cover the land. And it shall be in the latter days. And I will bring thee against my land. That the heathen may know me. When shall be sanctified in thee. O God before their eyes. Modern Israel has probably one of the best trained. Best equipped armies on the face of the earth today. The Israeli Defense Force or the IDF. And as we look at this passage of scripture, we see something must happen to cause her to surrender her weapons. And that is the peace accord with the Antichrist. That event will be the covenant that is established for protection. Which brings us now to the third seal. For the sake of time, I'm not going to read it, but that is chapter 6, verses 5 and 6. And we read there that it is a black horse that comes with the third seal. And that black horse represents for us suffering. Suffering from hunger. Famine follows warfare most of the time. And the balances here show that food will be such a precious commodity that it will be weighed carefully. And you can look at Ezekiel chapter 4 and verse 16 as further reference for that. The fourth seal is found in chapter 6, verses 7 and 8. The fourth horse is pale, or actually a yellowish-green color. The rider is death, and its companion is hell. At death, all unsaved go to one of these two realms, either Hades or hell, however you want to view it. But death for the body is not the end of it. Because we know because of Adam and Eve's sin and revelation in the book of Genesis that spiritual death passed upon all men. And so the soul will be sent to hell. This pale rider, this pale horse is death. Death physically, yes but death spiritually as well. But the scope of this judgment affects actually one-fourth of the entire world. And once this is done, we come to the fifth seal in verses 9 through 11 of chapter 6. And with the opening of the fifth seal, the, cha the view changes from earth to heaven. And John saw believers who had been martyred during the events of the first four seals or the first half of the, ju the judgment period. And the martyrs here in chapter 6 verses 9 through 11. Begin to cry out for divine vengeance. Upon their earthly adversaries. And God tells them that judgment is coming. You know there comes a point in time in every one of our lives. Where we get tired of everything that we're dealing with. And we wonder why God allows wickedness and evil to prosper. And, and it seems life is so hard. We've said time and time again that God's books are not balanced in October. That God will ultimately one day pour out his wrath upon evil. 
But that day is not yet. That day is coming, and as we look at Revelation chapter 6 and 7, we see the beginnings of that wrath being poured out. In verses 12 through 17, we have the sixth seal. The scene now changes from heaven back down to earth, and the sixth seal actually contains six different events. First of all, we see that there is a great earthquake. It will be of huge magnitude. And two other earth, earthquakes will occur later on in the book of Revelation in chapter 11, verse 3, and in chapter 16, verses 18 and 19. But we have with this beginning of the sixth seal a great earthquake. Then we see there is a blackening of the sun. Then there is a reddening of the moon. That is followed by a shower of huge meteorites. And finally, a convulsion of the planets and the stars. This world will see things that they have never seen before. And then there will be the collapse and disappearance of mountains and islands. Judgment is coming. Judgment from a God that is more powerful than anything you and I can ever imagine. A God that can reconcile the rights and the wrongs with one fell swoop. We move to chapter 7, and chapter 7 is a little bit different because it gives us a bit of a break between the judgments. And it deals with the tribulation saints. This chapter contains just a little bit of information from the view of heaven. There is a delay in judgment. John saw four angels holding or restraining the four winds of the earth, the north, south, east, and west. Then a fifth angel charged the four angels not to release their winds until the servants of God had been sealed in their foreheads. In verses 4 through 8, we have the 144,000. These are the servants of God that are sealed in their foreheads. These are Jews out of every tribe of Israel, 12,000. They are Jewish and they are Jewish evangelists. These 144,000 are apparently saved during the events of the first six seal judgments. In verses 9 through 17, we have the great multitude. John sees a multitude without number, a heavenly host. They came from all nations on the earth. Thus, we can assume that from the fact they came from all the nations of the earth, that a majority of these, or many of these at least, are Gentiles. But it will also include Jews. They are God's redeemed people. Clothed in the robes of imputed righteousness. Made white by the cleansing of Christ's blood. In their hands they hold palms. And their lips testify to the fact that they are saved in verses 10 through 12. And this mighty host of believers, of redeemed believers are joined by the angels in their worship and adoration. Although angels have not experienced salvation as we know it, the Bible tells us that they rejoice over one sinner that comes to faith in Christ. In Luke chapter 15, verses 8 through 10. The great multitude of converts are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. The description that we see here indicates that these believers that are saved and martyred during the tribulation period are this great host. Verses 15 through 17 name ten provisions of divine blessing that will be theirs in heaven after their suffering on earth. This time will be a time of a great harvest of souls on the earth, but also a time of unprecedented persecution for those who follow Christ. All within the space of ten years, or seven years, sorry. As we close this morning, the truth of the matter is, is that God is a God of love. God loves every one of us, I believe, as though there were but one of us to love. We have, we have read time and time again, John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Friends, judgment is coming. 
There is coming a day when men will no longer mock the name of Jesus Christ. There is coming a day when righteousness will be restored. There is coming a day when this world will one more time fall into line. Wouldn't you rather come to Christ during this time? And place your faith in Him as your Lord and Savior. Than to stand before Him as your judge. We are told in the book of Philippians that every knee will bow. And every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. To the glory of God the Father. There is a time coming. Unlike anything we have ever seen. This world will, even in the midst of that judgment, their hearts will be hardened. You're invited to come to Christ today. You're invited to place your faith in Him. To repent of your sin, to turn to Him. Today we are living in the age of grace. A time where we are told that God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And so if you're watching this morning and you've never placed your faith in Jesus Christ, you've never turned to him in faith, I invite you to do that this morning. And friend, if you're here and you're saved and you know Christ is your Savior, let me encourage you that we are, I believe, living in the final days. I believe that everything we see around us that is taking place is simply pieces of the puzzle falling into place. That we are very soon going to see things even accelerate as we approach the last days. And so I encourage you to live for Christ. I encourage you to serve Him in these days. So many of us are of the opinion that one day, when, things, when life is less busy, when things get a little bit less stressful, when, when work is less demanding, when my kids are grown, then I'll get involved and I'll serve Christ. None of us is guaranteed tomorrow. None of us is guaranteed 10 years or 15 or 20. Let us sell out to Christ now. Let's give him our all in these days. And let's live for him. That one day we may hear him say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Father, I pray today that as we have looked at some very sobering scripture this morning, I pray that your spirit may take it and may accomplish that which you will in each and every one of our hearts. Father, may you bring to yourself those who are outside, those who are yet lost in their sins. Father, may you speak to the hearts of your children that we would cease being wishy-washy, that we would stop living with one foot in the world and one foot in the church. But that we may give you our all. That we may take up our cross and follow you. That we may be used of you. Father, bless us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to take uh, a moment and I want us to sing uh, one verse. Of redeemed. Redeemed how I love to proclaim it. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed through his infinite mercy. His child and forever I am. Here at home I invite you to sing with us. This last song. Redeemed how I love to proclaim it. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb.
If we can minister to you in any way over this next week, we invite you to contact us. The office will be open uh, Wednesday and Friday, and we encourage you to make contact. And if you need us before then, you can always reach me on my cell phone or by email. God bless you. Have a great week. God is still on the throne.